AFBF Vice President of Communications Terry Moore will moderate the discussion between AFBF President Zippy Duval and Beth Ford, President and CEO of Land Lakes. Thanks, Jonna. Welcome to our fireside chat with Beth Ford and Zippy Duval. It's my pleasure to introduce both. Beth Ford serves as President and CEO of Land Lakes Incorporated, a Fortune 200 food production and agribusiness company that is also a nearly 100-year-old farmer-owned cooperative. Best 35-year career spans six industries at seven companies. Since joining Land Lakes in 2011, she's held a variety of roles leading the Farmer to Fork business offerings. Today, she's a passionate advocate on behalf of farmers and rural America with the goal of connecting people, particularly in urban areas, to the farmers and rural communities who grow their food. A native of Sioux City, Iowa, Beth holds a bachelor's degree from Iowa State University and a master's degree in business from Columbia University Business School. She also sits on the board of directors for the Business Roundtable and numerous other industry, nonprofit, and university boards. Beth has been recognized by Fortune as one of the world's 50 greatest leaders and most powerful women. She was named to Fast Company's Most Productive People and Best Leaders lists, among other honors. She was also featured in the 60 Minutes segment entitled the Farmer Advocate in 2019. Zibby Duval serves as the 12th president of the 102-year-old American Farm Bureau Federation. Since being elected in 2016, his leadership helped to shape a new farm bill, defeat misguided regulations, shepherd new trade agreements, and ensure farmers and ranchers are supported through natural disasters and the devastating effects of the global pandemic. He is a third generation farmer from Georgia who previously served as the Georgia Farm Bureau president. He owns a beef cow herd, raises broiler chickens, and grows his own hay, all while continuing to restore the land he inherited. He made me promise to keep his intro short so we can dive into the discussion. So I'll stop there and just say welcome to both of you. It's wonderful to have you with us. And I think a great place to begin the discussion is really talking about the top issues ahead. Uh, our two organizations have certainly had a storied history and century of service to members. And if you look all the way back to the 1920s, Minnesota Farm Bureau actually helped the forerunner to Land Lakes launch a membership drive. Now, of course, Land Lakes is a giant in the industry, a farmer owned cooperative with several big brands celebrating your 100th anniversary. I understand, Beth. Congratulations on yes. that. Yes. Just as American Farm Bureau turns 102. So from your vantage points, what are the top issues farmers and rural communities should pay attention to in 2021? And Beth, I'll invite you to begin the conversation. Thank you. And first of all, thank you for the opportunity, the invitation to be here today. It's terrific. I wish we were together in person, but this is, I guess, the next best thing. And, and hopefully we'll get some uh, good interaction. Uh, President Duval Zippy, what a treat and pleasure. Quite an honor to be with you here today. You know, our organizations, as you said, started around the same time, 1920s, uh, Land Lakes founded by Upper Midwest dairy farmers trying to get power in the channel and get their sweet cream butter into the population centers in the east. And so they formed a marketing cooperative and then that was successful so then they followed that with a supply cooperative and as you say now we are uh you know we have a business that goes still from the farmer we have still a farmer owned cooperative and it goes all the way till retail we have our purina business we have a winfield technology where we uh, work with growers we have a sustainability business um truterra uh we have an ngo um, Venture 37, we're working with uh, smallholder farmers around the, the country. We have multiple businesses that comprise Land Lakes. So your question was, what was in front of us? Well, we know we've still got about six months or more for this vaccine rollout. Um, this past year, I could not be prouder of the resilience of the farmers, our farmer members of our team who have come through this this very, very challenging operating environment and delivered terrific results for the foundational issue that is uh, tied to this cooperative, and that is um, food production and agribusiness. What was interesting it, back in March was, uh, you know, in my role as CEO, when this started to come uh, forth as a, an issue, the pandemic, 
immediately did what you do, check the liquidity of the business, we have to be able to withstand anything that comes at us, then check what um, the issues were that farmers were likely to um, encounter, and then really work on the safety and security and health, that includes the mental health of our team. And that is what we've been focused on. So as we step into 2021, I wish I could say, boy, we finished December 31st and that's over. And now this, this is gonna be all bright skies. Um, that's not actually the case. We know that we're going to be in for some bumpy times as we come out of this pandemic um, and as we step into, I guess, normal. Um, what, uh, you know, the priorities back then are still the priorities. We lead with our member health, our farmers, our team health, uh, their security, and we focus on the business partnerships that drive us um, over the long term. So those are our, what we're laser focused on. Now we can talk about some strategic issues. We've got a new administration that's gonna be stepping in, some of the ways that we can partner there, and I'm sure we'll have that as part of this conversation. But that is what we're, we're focused on as we start 2021. Well, Beth, that's uh, very similar with us. On the front of our minds is making sure that everybody's safe and. Uh, you know, we have to keep our grassroots engaged at the farmers and ranchers that are out on the farm each and every day, trying to keep them engaged in in uh, developing policy and moving us forward, uh, even during the pandemic. And, and Farm Bureau is a lot, it, a lot of policy, a lot of fellowship and a lot of food. And we uh, we enjoy all three. Uh, and, and with the fellowship kind of moved aside because of the pandemic, the food kind of moved aside because you don't make all those covered dish suppers and barbecues, but the policy is, is the main focus that we have. And, and I am really, really proud of our organization and our farmers and ranchers for jumping over that hurdle and taking on technology and being able to continue to do that. And that's what we'll be doing at this convention, finalizing our policy for 2021. But the issues remain the same and, uh, you know, they, they, they changed a little bit during the pandemic, but the issues that were here before the pandemic will be here when we come out of the pandemic. And it's around trade, and we all live off of, of the accomplishments that we uh, make in trade and, and the accomplishments that the, this administration has had and the next administration will have. It's going to play a big role in what we how we move forward. Uh, but labor, I tell everyone, the biggest limiting factor of American agriculture is is our labor force. Uh, no one in America really wants to do this kind of work anymore. And the programs that we have access to now are too cumbersome, too expensive, and they're not even available to the dairy farmers that are in your cooperatives. Uh, so we need to have a legislative fix to uh, having guest workers come here and work and not be seasonal, but be able to take help all of agriculture. And then of course, climate smart farming and policies that are gonna come along with that uh, are very important to us in making sure our farm, farms are sustainable in the future and continuing to do all the great work that we've been doing for decades, but capitalizing on technology and moving forward to even do more to be part of the solution, just like we have in the last three decades, part of the solution as we move forward to protect our climate. You know, can I, can I add a couple things? I, I think, uh, Zippy, you, you hit on some really critical points. Immigration reform is going to absolutely be critical. As I've touched base with the Biden administration, that you know, we continue to put voice to the fact that it's fine to talk about tech workers and immigration reform for tech workers, but we need some, some um, uh, farm labor because otherwise it constrains us. One of the, I don't want to call it a bright side, but I would say that uh, certainly it was made more obvious during this pandemic, the critical nature of our safe, affordable, resilient food supply. This is a national security issue. I say this all the time. We should all consider it this uh, a national security issue. Um, other countries, China, others are investing so that they can have a sustainable food supply that we already have. And so we have to make sure we're investing appropriately. That includes the use of technology in modern agriculture. It includes reforms like immigration reform and the technology for use on the farm and in the rural communities and for the families that are farming for us as a nation. So I, I'm, I'm gratified that the resilience of the farmer, the, the, the nature of the farmer in this pandemic has been made very clear and that national uh, security issue of a safe, affordable food supply was made obvious 
obvious to everybody. And boy, did did the farmers deliver. And now we're stepping into what I hope is going to be, I guess, a more productive 2021. I see grain price up, you know, corn prices up, bean prices up. There's some some uh, stronger fundamentals. And I, I'm uh, hopeful that that means we'll, we'll start focusing on some of these other long-term issues like the investment in technology um, in communities and in agriculture that we know is so uh, critically important. And we certainly know that the precautionary shutdown sent a shockwave through the value chain all the way to the farm. Um, so we've seen the resiliency of the supply chain, but also the challenging aspects of a just-in-time system. So what are the lessons learned from that? And where do you think we'll land in terms of changes that affect farmers and ranchers because of the pandemic? And President Duvall, if you'd kick us off. Well, you mentioned just in time system of one we have gotten used to in America. Uh, and now we got to think about, you know, what that balance is with just in case, just in case something like this happens again, what do we do? We can't afford uh, with this just in time system, we can't afford to have processing uh, facilities shutting down because of pandemic or health reasons. We got to find some way to fix that, make sure that employees are protected because everything backs up when that happens. And when it backs up, farmers pay a tremendous price for it. And we got to find some way to get past that. You know, uh, during this time, uh, we realized that there are um, some discrepancies around pricing really around pricing of beef is where it was so obvious where consumers were paying more and all along our producers were getting less and less for their products. Uh, so we, we see some uh, legislative moving to help support smaller processing plants for uh, harvesting animals. And we see that as, a, as a, a good thing and we look forward to working with policies that shape an environment that helps us uh, fit that just, just in case time if it ever happens. You know, from my perspective, you, you really have kind of this really interesting dynamic. You have these kind of two countervailing pressure points. One, the farmer has to, um, to deliver a safe, affordable food supply, affordable food. And so that means you have to have lowest cost possible, which demands efficiency, which means the value chain is very tight because you can't have any slack in the value chain because otherwise you have too much expense. And so how do you make sure that you have appropriate investments so you have alternatives when you have a situation like this? I don't know that there's going to be a necessary policy change. What it does is it points out how tight this value chain is, how animals are grown to a particular point in time. And boy, if it backs up, now we're in the situation like we were in the hog markets where we had to euthanize because we had, you know, we had a situation where we had an, uh, an oversupply and everything backed up. So this countervailing pressure is not is not unique to agriculture, but boy, did it really point out some of our gaps. Um, the second piece of this is what we all know about any business is that having a, a stable operating environment is critical. You can be, you can have the best performance. And for agriculture, my observation would be that means that the rural communities, the investment in healthcare in these communities, that uh, access to education for children, because these are families, um, that is absolutely necessary. And we have underinvested in these communities in terms of uh, technology, in terms of roads and infrastructure and other areas. And so again, in this, in this uh, dynamic, in this pandemic, what I'm gratified to say is any conversation I've had um, with the last administration or with the current administration and then with the upcoming administration had been focused on the necessity of investment in um, in infrastructure, yes, broadband, yes, roads, yes, um, you know, uh, water, transportation, um, but also around the access to health care. And so our, our discussions around um, technology were really accelerated um, with the, the realization that we certainly had that telemedicine and, and medical access during a pandemic was going to be critical. And we've had so many rural hospitals that have shut down. So it's hard to be productive in agriculture when you have to worry about whether you can get and see a doctor um, or, you know, for any kind of farm accident or for any kind of issue. It's hard to, to be productive in agriculture if your children's school has shut down because of a pandemic and they don't have technology 
technology. You know, 18 million Americans lack access to broadband. 14 million of them are in rural America. So I'm I'm pleased to say that most of the discussions we have around infrastructure and around um, the future uh, investments around agriculture, yes, is going to be about the use of tools, and yes, it'll be about looking at the value chain, but it's also about the ecosystem that we know is critical um, to having a stable operating environment for agriculture. You spoke about it, Beth. We, we have sort of the digital divide creating a group of haves and have nots on display like never before. And I know Land O'Lakes uh, undertook the American Connection Project as sort of a creative way to help address that. And, and American Farm Bureau and several state farm bureaus are participating. So thanks for inviting us to join. But tell us a little bit about more, more about that and what you think is needed to close the digital divide. Well, what we, we started with even before the pandemic was, you know, awareness, advocacy, action, awareness, advocacy, action. So, you know, what was always interesting to me is uh, you could see this was a priority. I was named CEO. I was out in many communities. I'm from Iowa. These were my towns that I've known for forever, you know, and um, where our members are. We touch over 10,000 uh, rural communities across the United States. We're in 50 states. So when I'm out there, I'm recognizing, boy, there's just been a lack of investment. Job creation in rural communities has only accounted for like 6% of new jobs over the last, let's say, five years, and 60 plus percent are in urban areas. So why is that? And why are rural hospitals shutting down? Well, we know technology is the wave of the future. It's not the answer, but we know it is It is like electricity. It's like the 1930s rural electric initiative where we have to have that capability so that jobs can be created, so that investment can be made. So when we, we started talking about this even before the pandemic, and then it really it, you know, it was in sharp relief during this pandemic that without this access, there was going to be a left behind again um, narrative for many communities, including rural communities, because they were not going to be able to access education or health care. We started by forming the American Connection Project, which is now 135 different organizations. Thank you to the American Farm Bureau. Thank you to many other partners, Cargill, Tractor Supply, uh, Microsoft. I mean, any number of companies that maybe were unaware of this gap previously, but now have joined hands and said, we've got to close this. This is about American competitiveness. This is an American issue. It is not a geographic issue within the United States, rural, urban. It is an American competitiveness issue. So we're advocating for a major investment $80 billion plus, that's what the estimate is that will close this digital divide. We believe we need accurate mapping, right? So we need to know where to invest. And we need a more efficient methodology for rollout. It can't be a jump ball between the FCC and USDA and other state and local agencies. It has to be implemented with speed. And so we're advocating. We have policy um, initiatives. We're, we're, we're working with DC, with governors and uh, others to say this, this should be a priority and one of the first priorities for infrastructure investment. The American Connection Project at the same time said, we gotta take immediate action because it could take a long time to lay the wires. So why don't we say, if you're in a rural community right now and you have Wi-Fi, Let's work with the Airband product for uh, Microsoft. Let's partner, let's turn your Wi-Fi on, make it accessible to citizens in the town who can come and park outside and, and maybe finish their homework or access a doctor or something. And so right now we have, I wanna say it's like 2,600 sites across 49 states. Um, we certainly turned our sites on. I know uh, similarly um, uh, you did as well. And um, we've, we've been told, um, for instance, Tractor Supply, they turned it on. They've had over a million visitors. We're having thousands a day who are pulling up and saying this is a way that they can uh, get some access. So we wanted to do something immediately, you know, kind of grassroots, and then over the long term work on the policy issues um, and prioritizing this as one of the number one investments for an infrastructure bill in this next administration. Totally agree with you, Beth, and, and we have to click. Uh, bring this great divide closer together and it, it is uh, you know I look at broadband as we used to think it was uh, a luxury but it's a necessity now in our lives each and every day and we want to congratulate you and Land of Lakes and I want to congratulate some of our State Farm Bureaus that have grasped on and been partners of you because they're the one that have the county offices across across America in 2700 counties and I know a lot of them have participated and answered the call. So 
uh, really, really are proud of that part of our organization. You know, to move agriculture forward, we have to have access in our marketing and the technologies uh, that we're going to be using in the field to protect, it, be more, uh, be conserve more of our uh, waters and lands. Uh, we, we have to have the ability to uh, uh, control the environment and our, and our animal housing because we want to make sure that our animals get treated treated right. So, and all that depends on having good uh, good broadband. So it is absolutely crucial that we do that. You know, I, I remember the story when I was traveling and I made all 50 states in Puerto Rico in two years. But I, when I went to Kansas, I went to West Kansas and, you know, the communities are way far apart. And the community meeting that I got to sit down at, the dominating conversation was around broadband, health care, and how do we bring it to our community so that our young people, when they get through with college, want to come back home. They want to come back home, but they go to these urban areas to college and they have access and they're not going to come home and live without it. And so to bring jobs, bring our young people back home, to, to lower the age of the average farmer, we got to have access to it. It's just as important as the movement was when we brought electricity. I couldn't agree more. And you, you hinted on the healthcare piece. You know, there have been over 130 rural hospitals that have shut down in the last couple of years, and it's not like they're so numerous anyway. And one of the fundamental areas uh, of that, and what we heard in this partnership for American Connection Project and our partnership with the Mayo Clinic, for instance, and with the Cleveland Clinic, is that they have had more telemedicine appointments in one day than they had all of last year. This has been an accelerant and to me will be a stabilizer for these communities because you're also not going to go to a community where you don't have access to a doctor, you know, uh, it, it, for for the long term. Secondarily, one of the other portions of that is that they've seen a great increase and I think we should take tremendous confidence and, and excitement in this in mental health appointments mental health appointments, because again, 90% of providers are in urban or suburban areas. There's a huge gap in rural areas for mental health providers. And as we all know, farm, uh, suicides, rural suicides have been increasing at a rate greater than in any, many other communities. So having that access, they've also had a, a significant reduction when it's a telemedicine appointment for a mental health provider, like a 60% decline in appointments not kept. It's about the mental, emotional health and about the physical health. And so that access and broadband, in addition to being on the farm, having the right tools, having the right access to, to, um, to issue or to providers like this, I think is gonna be a great stabilizer and uh, something that can accelerate growth in some of these communities. And we have had so many challenges hit agriculture over the last five or six years who would ever thought pandemic would be the latest one? And farmers just don't have the nature to go talk to somebody about their problems. And and you're exactly right for, for someone to sit in the privacy of their home and do telemedicine, especially through uh, through uh, uh, mental health, it is a, is a great opportunity uh, for us to help people uh, because of the privacy part of it and the stigma that goes along with mental health health issues. And that's why we at Farm Bureau have worked so hard to uh, have an interest in this area. Even though we're a policy shop, uh, we're still concerned about our fellow farmers and our grassroots out there and what they're going through. Uh, and we've had some great partnerships with the National Farmers Union and uh, uh, Farm Credit uh, to put out, uh, uh, put out a, a rural resilience training people to be able to learn and see the signs of it. Farm State of Mind uh, program that we've got uh, launched now that people can go to and find resources they can help their loved ones with or someone that's going through a difficult time can find those resources. And, and, and we're seeing people use it because they can do it in the privacy of their home. And you're exactly right. It, it is a tremendous help, but we can't do it without access to broadband. That's right. Well, thank you both. We covered a lot of ground in those answers and, and we appreciate it. Let's switch gears a little bit now and, and talk a little bit about another topic that is of very, very high interest right now, and that's sustainability and specifically climate smart farming practices. The pressure for action is intense. It's coming from multiple directions. 
And uh, both American Farm Bureau and Land O'Lakes support the bipartisan Growing Climate Solutions Act. And I know uh, American Farm Bureau also helped to form Farmers for a Sustainable Future and then the Food and Ag Climate Alliance. So President Duvall, if you would kick this one off and tell us just a little bit more about those efforts and why you think they're important. And then Beth, please do the same. Well, we know we, we've seen the conversation start several years ago and uh, we knew that the uh, as we approached this new Congress that there'd be a lot of the conversation around uh, climate policy. So we tried to get ahead of it a little bit and we uh, got a lot of different ag groups together to create uh, Farmers for Sustainable Future so that we could make sure that we told the farmer story so that we could take the seat at the table and, and, and be able to tell about all the great things that we've done for decades now and how far we've come since the, since the 60s in improving our, our land and conserving our natural resources. Uh, and then the opportunity came up to uh, lead uh, bringing like groups uh, like Farm Bureau and that think like us, but also bringing up other groups that might not always think the way we do. Uh, and that created the Food uh, and Agriculture Climate Alliance. Uh, and I'm real excited about that. We were very uh, not sure of how that would turn out. We didn't know whether we could find common ground, but we did find some common ground on certain principles and then put forth some recommendations and we understand that that is uh, uh, on Capitol Hill and being spread around between congressmen and senators to discuss what climate policy might be. We want to make sure that we uh, make sure that our farmers are respected, uh, that they're recognized for all the work they've already done uh, in the past uh, and, and to make sure that as we move forward uh, that these are voluntary programs that are, are, are market-based. Uh, you know, if we look at what's really happened though, and a lot of people don't give farmers the credit that they really deserve, there's over 140 million acres been put in conservation programs. That's California and New York put together. That's a huge amount of land that farmers have put out there to cons uh, in conservation. Uh, you know, the renewable energy that has been produced on our farms and used on our farms has cut the, uh, uh, cut the greenhouse gases back uh, at the tone of 17 million cars in a year. Uh, so we have come a long, long way in taking uh, the practices that are already available to us and, and done a, a tremendous job and we want to make sure our farmers get recognized for that. And then you got to talk about what research is going to bring to us in new practices and new ways that farmers can participate and do that. And if it's, if it's in policy that allows them to voluntarily uh, uh, take part in those practices, our farmers have proven that if you let them volunteer for something that has sound science and is market-based, they will latch onto it and they'll do a really good job with it. So we're looking forward to using those two organizations, two alliances, to work together with Congress to develop uh, climate policies that respect our farmers and give them an opportunity to be, continue to be part of the solution of the problem, not, a, not, not the problem itself. Yeah, let, me, let me add, I guess, a couple of things. And thank you for the leadership on, on forming that coalition, because I always think, of, and I always say, you know, farmers, the original environmentalists, everything at stake, this is their livelihood, their way of life. They invest constantly in their land and new practices to improve the soil health, the water, the, the air. Um, and, and so we know um, that those improvements have led to an improved posture for agriculture. There are a couple things that I think of and that we think of as we think about sustainability going forward in climate, um, climate change. One is that banks will start lending against investment that, that uh, farmers are making to make sure that their land is resilient. We should understand that that is likely to happen. It already is. Carbon will start to get priced more aggressively. So um, we've seen a carbon market trading. We've partnered now with Nori, uh, who wants to be like the eBay of carbon credit trading. So as that starts to get priced, um, we can be a carbon sink. Agriculture can be a carbon sink. It can go carbon negative and be part of the solution to climate change. And so that's an opportunity. Farmers are pretty smart about understanding how to do revenue generation and practices they can put in place um, in order to, to capture that opportunity. Now, 
That means go back to the broadband discussion. Our tools, we started TrueTerra, our inside engine. Um, it's a database analytical platform that allows a farmer to understand the investments they can make to improve their sustainable production. It also is a way we can track carbon capture so that we can have carbon credit trading markets, have that market develop. And so what do you need to do that? Those are data intensive models. So you have to have broadband, you have to have technology. This is gonna be the way of the future. This is a proof point for the use of technology and, and making sure we have climate smart practices. We could go through a litany of ways we're working with different states or the federal government on opportunities and practices and improvement. But another way we need to start thinking about this in my view about agriculture um, and about the future and the implications of climate investment especially this administration or the upcoming administration has started to, to uh, push on this and we saw this start to occur in California. California, that state has now said that you're going to go to electric vehicles, no combustion engine um, a vehicle can start to be uh, purchased by 2035. So let's think about this. Now, I sit on a board of a, a Packard, the manufacturer, Peterbilt, Kenworth, and Doff Trucks. So I get a lot of access to understanding battery technology in the acceleration and the use of hybrids in the electric vehicles. We can talk about the, the policies on the farm, but there's also other um, implications for biofuels. Because the reality is, as we go to electrification of the transportation sector over the next number of years, and as incentives are pushed, there will be an accelerated pace for that and thus the reduction in the utilization of biofuels. If that happens, we need to sit there and think forward about what the implications are for corn price, for bean price. You know, what is it? 40% of corn goes into um, ethanol. Biofuels, I want to say it's like 18% or so of beans used in biofuels for, um, in the diesel side. And so there are real significant implications that may not seem like a direct line but being involved, as you have been, President Duvall, and elsewhere, to help people understand the other implications for accelerated change around climate smart policies, not necessarily even directly related to different practices on the farm, although that's an opportunity, carbon credit trading, carbon sink. Um, but what are the, the long-term implications of different policies that may accelerate a transition for instance, against electric vehicles and the reduction in the use of biofuels. What are we seeing? What's the biggest uh, country that has the, the most investment in electric vehicles? It's China. So even thinking that as an export market for corn and beans, they're already going down a particular path. So when we sit there and think about it, we think about the future, the, the likely policies that will come forward. How do we make sure that our members are well uh, situated, the farmers are well situated to have opportunity and also to address some of the carryover implications of potential policy changes that may, may accelerate uh, a transition to a different type of um, uh, you know, EV type of transportation sector. A great look ahead and into the future, which, which you've become known for, Beth. And by the way, we congratulate you on your many recognitions. But of course, on being recognized by Fortune Magazine as one of the world's greatest leaders and most powerful women. Wow. Um, mm -hmm. You've certainly been a barrier breaker on multiple fronts. And as a nation, we're struggling right now with some issues around diversity and equity and inclusion. I know you've used your voice to elevate these issues and advocate for change. So tell us a little bit about your efforts and how you're working with others on this front. You know, I think all of us want to be valued for the work that we provide, the, the leadership we provide. Agriculture, I, I think people have a, a misunderstanding. I, what I find about our members, about our farmers, about farmers in general, is that they want results. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. They want, uh, you know, ev everybody is welcome to, to come in and to work hard, you know, put the hard work in. And that means that we, we have diverse voices. We talked earlier, uh, President Duvall and I here, about immigration, immigration reform. We're not trying to say immigration isn't necessary. In fact, we're saying, please bring the hardworking um, uh, different uh, ethnic groups in. That will help. And so, you know, I, I put voice to these issues because I think it's so important. Agriculture um, is a, a, such a great opportunity, an industry that does critical work. And we need all diverse voices. We need some of the best thinkers. We need the hardest workers. 
And I believe, I believe you, you do your best work. I do my best work because I am myself, because I show up as myself every day. I want to be valued for the work and the content of what I deliver, the content of my character, the relationships um, that, we pro that we provide in the leadership. And so I do speak to this because I think it's important that we don't have a kind of a narrow, only these folks are, are allowed um, I don't think that that's the way I've seen agriculture or our farmer members at all. In fact, it's, you know, let's bring in people that, um, that are excited about the work we do and value it and respect it. And so I, I, I do speak to this quite a bit because I think it's important, especially in these times, that we kind of all step back and bring the temperature down a little bit and really talk about um, diversity of opinion is, is a really good thing. Diversity is a good thing. And in agriculture, we need the best and the brightest. We need everybody involved because guess what? We've got some challenges. We've had some challenges, but what the work that is done every day is so critically important to this country um, and diversity is part of that. Since I've come to this office five years ago, I've always talked about being inclusive. Because to me, for us to do our job each and every day, we have to have a well-rounded policy. Inclusive to me means gen different genders, uh, different races, different size of farm, different techniques of farming, conventional, uh, organic, whatever it might be. We need it all represented at the table. So. I've always talked about being inclusive to all kinds of people, all kind, all sizes and all kinds of, of, of production. Uh, our organization is 102 years old and it's, we, we are known to be very slow to change. But people that come to our organization give their time. So you have to have people that's interested in giving their time. So, you know, where we move forward, we've realized uh, over things that we've seen over this last year or 18 months, the, the uh, problems that have divided our country uh, when, it, when we talk about this issue. And we've realized that we want to move forward and try to do our part in, in solving some of those problems. So uh, we are really uh, intensely involved in developing new leaders for farm, farm for agriculture. I, I'm a product of that. I became part of the Young Farmer Program back in the early 80s through their contest at, at the head of Farm Bureau. And then, then all the leadership, the training that I went through and look where it brought me. I was just a little, uh, just a farm boy. And and so in our national committees with our Women's Leadership Committee, with our P&E Committee, uh, Promotion and Education Committee, and our Young Farmer Committee, I, I'm challenging them in 2021 to help us become more inclusive, uh, to bring in different types of people, different kind of production, different sizes, to make sure that Farm Bureau is their place where their voice can be heard, that we can really create that one rounded policy that represents one united voice for American farmers and ranchers. So I, I want to lead in that direction by challenging in the areas where we're developing leadership. And I think that over a period of time, we'll be successful in that. In the events that we've seen in our country over the last 18 months have made us be more sensitive and more aware of that. And, and I look forward to that challenge to, to being more inclusive as we move forward. You know, President Duvall, when, when I talk with my farmers or with our members, it, it isn't the first thing I'll use, uh, you know, um, racial differences. I spoke with this, uh, you know, what I say, they say, well, I, we don't see that difference. We, we aren't encountering that difference in our town. And I'll say, well, you understand why there's this passion, this increase. I said, I, I can tell you, and I'm in the Twin Cities, there are a number of very pro, you know, top professional CFOs of major corporations here, African-American, who's been stopped on his way to work 14 times. <laughs> you know, And so when you see that, and we could just all sit back and say, well, that's not right, but that's not the way we work. And I think I'm, I'm so grateful to hear uh, in your leadership, we're not looking for the differences. We're looking for inclusive voices within agriculture, within the news. I've seen that, and we have to understand where some of that work is left to be done. 
right? We, we want to make sure that there's, there's opportunity for all. And that's part of it is recognizing stepping back as we've tried to do during those very stressful times this past summer, listen to our um, team, um, black, African-American, other diverse groups about some of the pain they have, some of the fear they have, some of the concern. And what we say is every day we want you to know when you come to work, you're safe. You will be valued for the work that you do every day. And we're going to continue to work in our own communities to make sure that you understand as you leave work that you have the right place for your family um, and that you feel secure. And I think that that's all of it. Would, we would all wish for that. And we are, too, doing that at American Farm Bureau in our own organization at American Farm Bureau with people who work for us. We want to provide that. If, if they don't feel comfortable, we want to make it comfortable for them. We want to make sure that they are healthy and comfortable and taken care of while they're at work. And that's why we started our Race to Change Committee. That, you know, we want, want our people looking inside of our uh, uh, group, of our team at American Farm Bureau, so that we make sure that we're doing those things and be very sensitive to that. And I think that's, that's you know, we've recognized it now. We just got to move forward and, and, and act on it. Thank you both for those insights. Um, you talked about listening and engaging, and, and there's, there's another group that agriculturists spend a lot of time talking about engaging, and that's consumers. They're critical to our industry, of course, and for the first time in Gallup's 20 years of tracking American view of various businesses and industry sectors, farming and agriculture has risen to the top of the list in terms of public trust. We uh, did a poll at American Farm Bureau that shows the same thing. Nearly nine in 10 adults trust farmers. So your thoughts on how we leverage that? And Beth, if you'd started off, I know you're passionate about this as well. Well, we, we led, and in fact, we, we changed some of our packaging to, uh, to highlight what we knew consumers valued. They were surprised we were cooperative. They said, geez, if I didn't know you were cooperative, <laughs> I would have been buying your stuff all along. Um, that's great. And then um, farmers, we live with our farmers. That's what really what's important. So messaging against that, nobody is more respected than the farmer. Now we shouldn't be naive. And I say this to my team, don't be naive because the farmer is incredibly respected. Sometimes we are questioned about farm practices, right? So we have to continue along this narrative of educating educating consumers about what farm practices are, the hard work farmers do every day, and then really highlight what we're very proud of. Uh, we are proud of our farmer ownership. We're proud of our members. We're proud of the work that we do every day and that they do every day. But we also recognize our responsibility to 